in Cork, in, in Cork Skeptics, which is on an area that's very, very deep and very, very close to his heart, which is a little bit different to what we've, we've normally been kind of identifying, but that's, that's great. Um, it, I think this is going to be a very enlightening and interesting speech. And um, so I am absolutely delighted to, uh, to welcome up um, Reg Murphy, who's going to give us a talk on the industry of modern art and give us an insight on what all that whole area is about. So please put your hands together for Reg. Thank you. suggested to me that I might sort of come up with a talk. I don't really have the background to talk about science, so I can ask an intelligent question maybe, but that's about as far as it goes. What, what, what do I have a background in? I said, well, my background is fine art. About 20 odd years ago, I got a degree in fine art. It's an extraordinary idea in itself. I do to get a degree in fine art, but there you are. And for better or worse, I've been involved in it ever since, though these days more as a consumer than a practitioner. Um, anyway, what I'm talking about is the business, the industry of fine art. And um, let's start off with the first one to give you an idea. Okay. <laughs> just so I just get that out of the way, I'm not going to be talking about aesthetics. You know, the merits of one piece of art over another piece of art, or its intrinsic meaning, or its real worth. At the end of the day, these are. Um, the subjective questions, which are best left to philosophers, and are not really accessible to sort of sceptical analysis. What I am going to talk about is the industry of modern art. Um, and the theme of tonight's talk is really about the, the role of entertainment, wealth, and prestige in, in modern art today. And trust me, these are the fundamental drivers of, of the modern art scene. Um, let me see. Um, the world of contemporary art today is a worldwide industry that employs hundreds of thousands of people. It generates, you know, it um, entertains millions of people. It generates billions, quite literally. You know, it often involves government. Um, issues of fine art upset people, nations. Um, it's just a huge, huge area. Now, the, I've got a, as you can see, this is the aesthetic side bit, but I'm not going to deal with that. Now, I'm going to move you smartly on. Okay, probably all know this guy, Damien Hurst. This sculpture here is a great place to start. This sculpture is called For the Love of God. Um, this was auctioned about two years ago now for 50 million pounds sterling. Um, it was bought by a consortium of investors who included the artist himself, who apparently owns 28% of it. It seems bizarre to be buying your own work, also of a consortium. It's rather like a racehorse consortium, you know? Um, the Damien Hurst, as I speak, is having a one map retrospective from the Tate Modern in London. This will be a huge show. It's not by chance it was chosen for this summer, 
gives us the Southern Olympics. This is one of these mega shows that come along every so often. Great business for the tape. It's a big name. And, and it's quite an honor for a young artist who is not yet 50 years of age. Um, David Hurst is the classic example of the artist as a brand. He's a big name. He's quite possibly the richest living working artist in the world today. I chose my words carefully, there's lots of rich artists, but he's working. Um, anyway, I'm actually just like what I've said, a great fan of his work, you know, and I don't want to sound too cynical. Incidentally, that's probably his key piece there. That's the sometimes described as the $12 million stuffed shark. It's a tiger shark from the Great Australian Barrier Reef. Um, and it, as I suggested, sold for about $12 million. It started off as an idea. It's in the battle from Maldivite. Um, it's got a bizarre name. It's like, um, can anybody help me out here? The impossibility of eyes. The impossibility of imagining oh, death, death in the, the mind of somebody living. living. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, I won't dwell on him too long. I just said I'd start him off because he's quite well known. Now, what I'm going to do is give you. Sorry. No! <laughs> I thought. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a high speed history of modern art. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance because. This is going to be very high speed, otherwise we get all night, you know? And I've had to make broad generalizations, so um, bear with me on this. Okay, there's general agreement that the modern art movement starts with the impression painters in the late 19th century France. This is an era which is known as the Belle Epoque, the beautiful age. Um, you'd be the impressions with a number of past their members. Manet, Monet, Sisley, Degas, um, Pizarro, etc., etc. Names that you're all familiar with. Before I get into them, I just want to set the scene as it were, as academic arts that led us up to that period, because this really is a revolution in aesthetic terms. Um, prior to the impressions, artists of the past, or if you like, academic artists, they would have either been uh, painted portraits, as you can see, or the wealthy, the powerful, the influential. Mm. Um, this was very much the bread and butter work for artists that you were commissioned to do this kind of work. Or they, or they trained for years to attain the draftsmanship, to be able to depict scenes of martial glory, classical themes, you know, great heroics, and occasionally soft porn, you know? <laughs> And this wasn't to say that the work was, was bad, per se, or that the great paintings weren't produced to great art. Just simply that by the late 19th century, this type of work had become stable and boring. Now, let's see. And nonetheless, the work was popular with the public, and, it's, and it was very, it was displayed at least initially in uh, public views, in public view. Um, but there weren't many great collections, these public collections. These were mainly done, um, these were painted and sold to private collectors. Um, there were private collections, and the late 19th century is the point at which states began to think of building up public collections that later would be open to the public. Um, now, let me just move on this narrative. Okay. And um, art was, it was private collectors, and art was a commodity, as I said, but it wasn't quite yet entertainment. Now, the, okay, the gap year <laughs> in times past was known as the Grand Tour. Um, this guy, Edward Gibbon, um, in between 1776 and 1789, Edward Gibbon published the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Work like this and other influential writing kick-started an interest in classical themes. Um, wealthy young men of those ages began to discover the glories of classical Rome and Greece, and to some extent, we discovered the Renaissance masters. 
The effect of this on public taste was that these same wealthy young men went to places like Italy and later on to Greece and started bringing home paintings and sculpture. And this set this trend of academic themes. You've seen it in paintings. Um, a good international example of this, somewhat notorious, is the Elgin Marbles that are in the British Museum. An Irish example would be the bike collection that's in Rossborough House. Uh, so you can see this is this is this beginning too of the great private collections where art is acquired for prestige, you know, as you show it off to your friends, but not so much public yet. We'll come to that. Okay, now, now back to the impressions. Okay. In the 1860s, a small group of painters given the disparaging title of the Impressionists turned their back on the academic themes in favour of a study of naturalism, everyday subjects, light, loose brushwork. And looking at this now, it doesn't seem so you know, revolutionary to our eyes, but this was highly radical at the time, in the 1860s. When this work first went on display, people were very hostile to it. In fact, uh, the impressions were frozen out of public exhibitions in Paris at the time. Um, they had to resort to exhibiting their own work in a, a private salon called the Salon de Repis from 1863 onwards. But they weren't without their supporters. Emile Zola, the great French novelist, and a boyhood friend, Paul Cézanne, wrote favorably about impressionism. Um, the, their work inspired a second generation of artists who came along concurrently called post impressions and I'll come back to that in a second. And, uh, just one more. Sorry? Uh, so, yeah. There's the post impressions there I just wanted to show you. So, there we go. We'll come to them in a minute. That's just an intro. Now, the ideas of impressions is not spread quite quickly. Now, I'll show you this slide because there's an Irish interest. This is Roderick O'Connor, who visited Britain in the Asian ages. And he's regarded as a sort of Irish impressionist. Um, you see some of his collection in, uh, in museums. This guy here, Sir Hugh Lane, was born in Cork. He was a wealthy man of private means. And his importance is that he very early on collected uh, quite a good collection of impressionist paintings, many of which ended up here in the Hugh Lane Municipal Gallery in Parnell Square, Dublin. Now that is reputed to be one of the first modern galleries in the world. Um, Lane, if you see the date, died on the Titanic. And there was a problem over his will. The yeah, the Lane bequest. Um, his collection is jointly shared by the, the Old Tate Gallery in London, or the National Museum, I'm not quite sure which. Um, and it's shared jointly between Dublin and London, they swap it every five years. It's a very, very fun collection. So, yeah. Okay. Staying with impressionism. Smart dealers. <laughs> and Rose Waller, um, one of the first impressionist art dealers, abandoned his school in the law to <coughs> represent Sino and Cezanne, Renoir, Van Gogh, and uh, Gauguin. Um, he was, he bought their work very early on, and he's, his collections were particularly, had tremendous influence in Germany and um, in Russia also. He paid to tour shows of impressionist paintings in the United States as well. Um, the second guy, the man of the bow tie, that's Daniel Henri Kahnweiler. And um, Kahnweiler represented, um, sorry, this, uh, Toulouse Le Trac, Giacometti, and he had a lifelong association with this man, Pablo Picasso. Yeah. Kahnweiler was perhaps one of the most influential art dealers of all time. By dealer, I mean a person who also has a gallery 
they think is the words interchangeably. Um, Karl Mueller started a very novel idea of paying his stable of artists a basic salary to ensure he got a steady supply of that work or got the work at a fixed price. He was almost the first guy to do this. Um, also, unfortunately for Karl Mueller, he's lived a long time, he had the misfortune to be a German Jew. During World War I, the French government more or less stole his private collection. And in World War II, the Nazis did the same thing. However, he did survive the war and was living in neutral Switzerland. Now, okay. Now, this leads us to the second wave of post impressionism. The younger artists who came to Paris um, and saw the impressionist work were fired up and they began to explore their freedom, so to speak. Um, post impressionism is a catch all phrase that reflects a number of sub movements. You've got Pontonism here, Sinak and Silvat, and that's essentially the creation, making up a painting through thousands and thousands of tiny dots. You know, it's rather like exploding up a photograph. Um, the four of us, um, Doreen and Henri Matisse, this is large flat areas of color. You can see how radical painting is getting quite quickly, and Cubism. Um, George Brack um, and Picasso, in the leading lights. As such, this is the first movement, true movement towards abstraction. We were breaking the image down into basic forms. Um, the, now, anyway, sorry, let's do it again. in the bad light here, it's hard to see this. <laughs> now, the effect of all of this, post-impressionism leads us up to World War I. And it, World War I has the effect of slowing down the spread of these ideas throughout Europe. Immediately after World War I, the ideas that have been locked up for four years now explode throughout <coughs> Europe. Remember, we were only talking about Paris, right? As you can see now, you have surrealism which would be in um, Barcelona, Madrid, and um, Brussels by and large, Cubism and Expressionism, Deichtel in Holland, Constructivism in, in Moscow, Petersburg, um, Die Brücke, which is the form of German Expressionism, the Dada, which you find in neutral Switzerland, the Bauhaus in Germany, huge effect on design and typography, Futurism in Italy, um, um, and again, uh, Kandinsky up here. Now, these are explosion of ideas of different styles. Um, the, it's more about the technique than the actual subject, if you know what I mean, at this stage. Um, in fact, there was such a diversity of styles in the early 20s that it kind of left the public way behind. So public taste wouldn't catch up with us for a very, very long time. It's not, I'm not saying this was tremendously popular, it wasn't. You know, this is very much an elitist thing. Um, also, you could describe this as an era of manifestos. Each new group that came forward brought up attempts to bring up a strident manifesto. Perhaps they were influenced by Marxism, you know. But anyway, they bring out this, they issue this public manifesto saying what they were doing, and they criticized the other movements as they were either wrong headed or second rate. In the case of the Surrealists, um, they were perhaps influenced by Marxism, particularly um, their leading ideologue, André Breton, um, who later on became a friend and admirer of Trotsky. By complete contrast, the Futurists, who were tremendous admirers of extreme modernism, then became admirers of Mussolini, and became out like fascists, you know? So this is how it goes. <laughs> now, um, Okay, this is the scene in Europe in the 20s and the 30s. Right. It would probably come as a surprise to most of you that America owes its post war domination of modern art to Bismarck. <laughs> <laughs> the Nazis' extreme distaste for modernism in all its forms meant that that kind of liberal milieu of painters and artists abandoned Europe by and large, particularly Central Europe in the late 30s and decamped to the more open-minded societies of America, and to a lesser extent, England. 
and it's kind of Europe enters a sort of an artistic ice age during this period. All right. And so to New York, you know, the new scene for where the European emigres went. But not just artists, but also poets, writers, filmmakers, architects. A huge wave fetched up in America during this period. And New York did already have one great institution of modernism, and it's the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I think this was built in 1928 with uh, money from John E. Rockefeller, you know. Um, they had an inspired director during the 1930s, Alfred Barr, and who was responsible, and don't forget they were very well endowed, and they were able to buy up a huge amount of modernism. Generally agreed today that the MoMA is the best collection of modern art anywhere in the world. Um, that's a private institution. Um, the MoMA was joined later on by the Guggenheim, which I think is 1938, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And in 1966, by the Whitney, designed by um, Marcel Brewer of the Bajos. Now what's interesting about all of these, all of these are privately funded. You know? Um, in Europe, it would be somewhat the reverse. Also, there's something else going on here. The collectors in America, um, the big private collectors, um, donated or lent their work. Um, the, American, the big American collectors are very quick to perceive the prestige of showing your work in public. The, big, um, the prestige motive. Uh, so, pardon me, look at my notes, a lot of this is in my head, but sequence of right. Now, well, what if American art, what if it happening in America, it's not like this, sort of, this is grafted onto the American scene. Um, early American modern art, you had a very strong landscape school, people like Winslow Homer, and you had some stories towards expressionism and social comment you had that were popular in the night arts, the dining room, American Gothic, Black Wood. And um, this is Ben Shan, um, Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, the American modernism owes an awful lot to um, the Federal Arts Program, which was set up by Roosevelt in the 1930s, literally to, one, to employ unemployed artists. Um, but we haven't, you don't really see the full on abstraction that you see in Europe at the same period or even earlier. Now, now, the first true American art movement is in the late 40s is abstract expressionism. Although many of its leading exponents were Europeans, um, Rothko, Ernst, um, Gottlieb, de Kooning, uh, many of them, uh, see, that is, uh, it's one of the guy missing, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Ashil Gorky, that's the other chap. Um, this is a famous magazine, um, treatment that was done by Life magazine in the late 40s, a very famous shot list that they got them all together in one room and photographed them. Um, they were sort of a like-minded group who shared certain values, I'll show you the paintings now in a minute. As I said, the, the, this was hailed by the press as an expressly American government. But um, what was American about it was the fact that it took place in New York City to a great extent. But one guy in particular, Jackson Pollock would become very famous. Oh, no, I just shoved this in by complete contrast. Uh, it's no accident that abstract expressionism becomes a huge thing in America in the late 40s. It's the era of Red Scares and, and Joe McCarthy. Um, the American press took it on and mine as the abstract expressions. Um, because they wanted to put up something culturally against the Russians. Um, you could say an arts race alongside an arms race. Uh, what had been going on in Russia or the USSR as it then was since the rise of the Bolsheviks? Well, the Bolsheviks and Stalin in particular had no time for individualistic arts. They firmly believed that artists should serve the people or rather serve the state. You know? So the house style of um, the USSR at the time is often described as socialist realism. You know? Now, this became 
the accepted style that you find in all totalitarian societies. There are very little to choose between. You can see the model here of even the happy peasants, you know. You can see the endless wall art that you find all over South America, this case in Cuba. And this is a big sort of militaristic um, sculpture of even North Korea. Uh, and art in these societies would largely stagnate through most of the 20th century. But I'll come back to that at the Berlin by way of contrast. Okay, the abstract expressions. William de Kuru, Mark Rothko, and this here we are again. Jack the Dripper, this is known as. <laughs> it's sometimes described as action painting. Um, there's elements of expressionism about it. Pollock is significant because he's your first bona fide American modernist in some respects. Um, he was certainly lionized by the press. I'm, for my own part, I'm not a great fan of his work. Uh, be that as it may, Pollock didn't handle his success very well. Um, moody, volatile, alcoholic. He died tragically in a car crash, I think about the age of 44 or something like that. Um, and in so doing, into that enjoying mythology of geniuses taken from us too soon, rather like his near contemporaries, Johnny Parker and um, James Dean. And there's a lot of comparison there. Uh, now, something else has been happening as well. The art school scene in America has been influenced by European members, particularly the Black Mountain College in North Carolina. Now, this college and ones like it which produced the first crop of genuine American-born art, modern artists, as opposed to the abstract expressions. And through that, you have the next generation coming forward, which leads me on smartly to... Oh, sorry. Slightly jumping ahead of myself. Staying with Rocco for a minute, please be my pleasure. Um, staying with Pollock for a minute. Pollock got his first ex exhibition in a gallery belonging to Peggy Rubenheim. It's a remarkably um, significant figure in modern art. At different times, Peggy Guggenheim had galleries in Paris, London, New York, and finally in Venice. Um, she's probably more than anyone else introduced um, abstract expressions into New York. Um, remarkably, remarkably influential figure. Um, she had an affair with um, her own um, Samuel Beckett. <laughs> <laughs> so she really got her own. <laughs> and she persuaded her very wealthy uncle Solomon to build his great gallery on Fifth Avenue that I've already shown you. Um, at the same period of abstract expressionism, you've got cultural critics like Ken Greenberg, who writes about them, and you've got very savvy new gallery owners like Leo Castelli. As you can see here, Chuck and Johnny Warhol. Um, the significance of these last two is that. You need a good writing to some extent to, to uh, encourage people for a good buzz, good high ground writing. And there's something else going on here too. There was very few commercial galleries in the business of art, so to speak, until this period. It's really with the abstract expressions that you begin to get modern galleries, the business of selling the stuff at the end of the day. Now. Okay. Right, the next generation of American-born artists. <coughs> All right, the new generation of American-born artists look to their own society for ideas and themes. Um, they particularly took as their themes America's relentless consumerism and its obsession with violence. You know, its sort of self-obsession. What's really significant about this is that this was very little to the mainstream of European modernism. And in my view, this is a genuine breakthrough. Um, you've got Warhol here, and the ubiquitous soup cans, Roy Lichtenstein, Jasper Johns, go on and do loads of those plants. I think this painting was the first American modernist painting to make over a million dollars about 25 years ago at auction. Let me show you how much things have gone, how far we've come. Anyway. Um, now, after pop art, the 
the main stream of modernism, not just in America, but throughout the world, you don't have any major movements after that. You have a myriad of tiny movements, but then soon it diffuses into loads and uh, loads and loads of little movements and various groupings. Some which I'll give you now, uh, you see a multitude of isms. You've got land art, hard edge abstraction, conceptual art um, that we see. Um, super realism, color fields, uh, performance art, video, it can just go on and on and on and on. And the whole thing gets very, very diffused at this stage. And this point, I'm pretty much stuck on rapid history, uh, because other than that, it would just take too much time to explain what's happening. Now, so this will give you an idea of how to approach the same thing through realism, impressions, and forms, and what the whole. And believe me, that's only about a quarter of us of the main movements. Okay. At the stage, the public was mightily confused. And the media perceived the need to explain art to the general public, that is modern art, uh, in an appropriate form, that's television. So I'm going to make, mention three great, great television series, which are also best-selling and influential books. Now, the first is, 1969 BBC Civilization. Uh, although, some, although some are dated now, it is nonetheless a landmark of arts broadcasting and would ultimately be shown in some 60 countries. It was written and presented by the urbane and patrician Lord Kenneth Clark. Uh, Clark's central argument is that uh, art and culture are what define us as people and, and, and thus create civilization. Uh, it should be said that Clark only talked about Western civilization, although in his defense he wants to serve at the outset. Um, coming right along, in 1972, John Berger's Ways of, uh, Ways of Seeing. A strident and somewhat dogmatic Berger gives us a Marxist view of art. Um, in four essays, Berger reminds us that the art of the past was made for the wealthy for reasons of prestige, that much of art is inherently sexist, and advertising and may have superseded much of modern art. And when I was in art school, this book was still extremely influential, and widely read. And not to be outdone by the Brits, and in 1972, American television wrote up this huge series, The Shop of the New. This was written and presented by um, Robert Hughes, who actually died in the last 10 days. If you're watching the news, you can see the orbits. Um, an irreverent and articulate Australian, uh, Hughes brought a comprehensive history of modern art to a mass TV audience, um, and perhaps has had more lasting influence than the other two examples. Uh, very highly critical and, and enormously funny. If you get a chance, watch the YouTube clips. He's a scream. He's definitely called a spade a spade in very flowery language. Um, and it's, it's aged reasonably well. We've done an update of it in recent years. Um, it has to be said about Hughes, though, that he, had, he didn't really appreciate um, conceptual art, which is probably the most influential um, movement of his immediate period. That's enough. Now, what have been happening in Europe all this time? Um, as I said, after pop art, the scene in the art world is quite diffuse. Um, artists will typically pursue their own idea with no reference to their peers, and I no movements. Um, uh, England had embraced pop art and it produced quite a lot of uh, leading artists. So the revolution in art schools hadn't really yet, quite yet borne fruit. It's a very similar situation to Ireland. Um, Germany had a strong post-war art scene, but few big names and movements. Um, <coughs> but it's the French I'm really coming to. Um, the French are very peeved by their loss of artistic preeminence and America's absolute dominance in modern art since the late 30s. Um, as with many things in France, art is a matter of national glory. You know? In the early 70s, a new French president came to power, Georges Pompidou, took over from Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle was not known for his love of the arts. Um, 
Pompidou decided Paris needed putting back on the map seriously, you know? And in the early 70s, he commissioned the George Pompidou Center, named after himself, of course, and for visual arts in historic, in the center of historic Paris. Um, this was a, a very, very radical building at the time. And it was hugely divisive when this building was built, and uh, pissed off an awful lot of Parisians. Nonetheless, it was an enormous success. That's had 150 million visitors since it opened. It had to be closed for about three years just to repair you know, the constant wear and tear. Uh, they gathered up the best of their art, the modern art, and put it into that building. And this made a lot of governments sit up and take notice. And uh, number one, the French had got a huge prestige center, which reflected beautifully on governments. Number two, tourism. The potential was enormous. You know? um, as I said, governments took notice, but they were slow to act. Um, it took the regional Basque governments in Spain to really up the ante. And they were now entering into an, an era of prestige and um, art centers. This is just the Guggenheim Bilbao, designed by Frank Gehry, um, the American architect. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in Bilbao, but it's a really grimy, dirty, post-industrial city. This one building really put Bilbao on the map, and there was no reason you want to go to Bilbao except for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to be hypercritical. Um, no, Ireland even got in on the act. This is the Rima. That's the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Kilmainham, this mm. beautifully restored Royal Hospital. Uh, but over here we have the Tate Modern um, in London. That's the old Bankside Power Station that was restored. It's absolutely vast, huge, huge centre. Um, this ushers in this era. Now, what's going on here is that big governments get prestige. But not only that, but it's, you're talking about mass entertainment. Um, Take Modern gets approximately 5 million visitors every year. Uh, it just, you know, we're talking on the level of Disneyland here, you know, in terms of tourist numbers. In fact, in some cases, these art centres have become perhaps the main reason one visits a city in the first place. I'm not talking about the great cities, but I'm talking about smaller second division cities like Bilbao. Another thing that's happened, another couple of curious factors here. In the case of the Guggenheim Bilbao, the Guggenheim refers to the Guggenheim Gallery, which was built in 1938. It's franchising. They lend their name and some of their collection to their foreign governments. And they, uh, they lend the name for a price and they give them some of the collection and then away they go. In, in addition to this, the Guggenheim is negotiating with the government of Abu Dhabi and I think also in Las Vegas, they plan to uh, go to other centers. <coughs> the ground who really started this, ironically, were the Russians. And the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg were strapped for cash in the early 90s. And they opened up, uh, if you like, the Hermitage West in London in Somerset House. And this, there's another factor here as well. This, we're entering into an era here from about the Asian soundbox of what they call the blockbuster shows. Big state galleries with huge amounts of work and um, discovered it was a great revenue one um, to tour shows of their work. Um, they could tour a big show and it would earn great revenue money for them, mostly, and it would also earn money for the galleries it was going to. Uh, so then you get an idea. Now, okay, now I'm going to turn to the, the business end of this. I'm going to start this is the business of the art world. <clears throat> Let's start with the, the dealers, the commercial galleries. Let's know who this guy is in a minute. Basically, for an artist, the first point of contact with the public is probably through a gallery or an art dealer. Same thing. Um, an art dealer represents um, an artist in much the same way as, say, a rock band manager would represent a rock band. Um, the, the dealer would usually um, take care of the financing, public relations, or smooch the credits, and of course pro provide um, an exhibition space so that the artist work. A good dealer will spend a great deal of time and money grooming 
collectors. Uh, and in fact, the relationship between the dealer learner and the sales collector in the last decades, uh, whereas he might chop and change artists, um, artists come and go. It has to be said that artists are just as likely to jump around from one dealer to the other. A dealer can often command up to 60% of the sale price for artists exhibiting. So it's quite a lot of money. This guy is perhaps one of the most famous and notorious art dealers of all time, Joseph Henry Dubin. Um, he was enormously successful. Um, selling all masters from Europe to America, by and large. Um, the key to his success was the implied prestige of selling all work to new money. Uh, being cynically observed, um, Europe has loads of art and America has loads of money and big empty imagines and I put them together. <laughs> um, he was far from a saint in terms of in terms of sharp practice. And alas, he wouldn't be alone in, or wouldn't be unique in today's world of dealers. But anyway, now, the auction board, the next point of business. The dealers are sometimes referred to as the primary market, and the auction world is sometimes referred to as the secondary market. This is where work gets really sold. You can see an Andy Warhol portrait of Mao here, the Christie's. Now, you'll be familiar with the names, Sotheby's, Crippy, Christie's, Bonds, and things like that. Um, the era of record prices for modern art begins predictably with Impressionist paintings. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, and it tends to begin in Japan in the 70s when um, Impressionist canvases, particularly the works of Van Gogh, started making enormous money. Now, there's more to this than meets the eye. In the 70s, Japanese commercial property was the most expensive in the world. The Japanese government were anxious about overheating in the market, so they passed a law capping the price of certain properties. Now, in other words, you can only sell for a certain fixed price, but in reality, the problem was worth more than that, say, a big office block. Um, to get around it, companies would, I'd sell a property to you, but I know in my heart and soul that there's another 100 million yen in it or whatever it is. The buyer, I get them to give me an impressions master as a gift, you know? Um, and this is a way of this inflating up the cost of impressions canvases. The effect of these large prices had a, it had a disturbing effect in the art business. It brought in other investors that would otherwise never have been there, like pension funds. You know, banks and hedge funds started to get involved, chasing the big money. They now saw art as an investment, as a hedge against inflation. A not really different thing. They weren't collecting necessary for its own sake. And it should be noticed that there's a curious factor of work here also when you when you see these things, you know what's going on. Uh, the I'll say this slowly so you all tweet it. <laughs> it's a fact that nearly all the most important artwork will end up in public hands eventually. I know that sounds strange, but it's true. Um, if we took the canvases of, say, Van Gogh, um, the majority of them are the best ones are in public hands, and eventually they will nearly all be in public hands, even though they belong a lot, they will be the house private collectors. There's only so many of them in existence, the supply is finite, and um, forgery aside. Uh, because of this, very few of the important works by the old masters or now impressionists come up for sale. Um, the effect is this, is that big collectors um, constantly are looking to younger artists, and this causes inflation in the market to some extent. Um, We have seen a type of hyperinflation in contemporary art in recent years, and very strange things have happened. I've talked about the lots of bulls of, the, um, of collecting in there. The, but something very, very singular happened in only the last three years. Despite the worldwide recession, for the first time in history, the price of modern artists, by that I mean people 
from Impressionism onwards, and indeed some living artists more significantly, has exceeded the price of old masters. Now, when I say old masters, I mean something like the Renaissance painters. Now, this has never happened before. It's quite a bizarre situation. Yeah, I'll leave that up for the moment. This is the third part of this, the role of government. Okay. Lastly, the section that we'll talk about the role of government. As you've seen, government funds these big um, art centres for reasons of prestige and tourism and so forth. Normally, the role of government is to fund and promote the arts, and they do that through the Arts Council, which would handle annual grants for the support of galleries, um, theatres, whatever, be that as it may. Um, but government also exercises soft power through this. Uh, a lot of countries would have a national register of artistic heritage. What I mean by that is there's certain things that are judged to be um, national treasures that can't be sold outside the country. Um, for example, Holland has a ban on selling the works of Vermeer. You can't sell the Vermeer canvases outside of Holland. This normally applies to antiquities, but increasingly it could be done into paintings. National governments would obviously have the biggest collections of work in the world. Um, they, they, it's become a branch of diplomacy to some extent. Um, a government can signal its warm relations with another government <laughs> by lending it work that would otherwise be reluctant to let outside the country. But the reverse is also true. Um, and a greed loan might suddenly be denied, you know, as there is maybe a diplomatic freeze. Uh, the government would say typically all of the work is too dead to travel, but the meaning is clear. <laughs> now, uh, the people's, a people's opinion of a piece of art can often have an effect on the government as well, occasionally with singular works. Now, very good, um, before I come to Guernica, I'm just going to mention again the Unbound Marbles. Um, a people's collective idea of their cultural heritage, and this will affect the way governments interact with other governments. Now, I'll uh, come to that again later on. Guernica, um, a very good case in point. Guernica, the origins of this painting, mm, uh, on that. No, yeah. in 1936, the Spanish nationalists uh, bombed the historic Basque town of Guernica, uh, generally regarded as one of the atrocities of the Spanish Civil War. In a fit of frenzy and rage, Picasso painted this very large canvas and donated it to the Spanish Republican government. They exhibited it in Paris and they toured around Europe to raise support for the Republicans during the Civil War. During World War II, for safekeeping, remember the Republican government was defeated and Franco came to power, and Guernica went to MoMA in New York, where it stayed until 1981. Um, by 1968, ironically, General Franco, who was the architect of the bombing outrage, made moves to get Guernica back to Spain. Quite strange, because he was a lover of modernism, but the painting had become such an icon at this stage, um, and is generally revered as an icon of the horrors of war. Um, eventually, and after much negotiation and diplomatic lobbying, um, Guernica was eventually returned to the Spanish government by um, Norman, New York. Today, it resides in the Renia Sofia, if I pronounce that correctly, in Madrid. However, the tug of war over Guernica wasn't over yet. Um, the city of Malaga and Andalusia claimed the painting on the grounds that Picasso was born there. Uh, uh, Barcelona and Catalonia demanded the painting on the grounds that Picasso grew up there, and the Basque regional government claimed that they had a moral right to the painting. Whether or which the painting is in Madrid, and it's very unlikely that the Spanish government will ever allow it to open that museum again to travel anyway. Oh, sorry, no, backwards. Okay, now it's to turn away from the dreary world of commercialism and money and collecting and that, I'm going to talk about collectors for a while. Um, okay, four collectors with different strategies. Um, my first is Baron Heinrich Tyson. 
and you can see his dates there. Um, Tyson was the heir to a vast banking and industrial fortune. I think of Tyson Steel. Um, his father started the collection of collecting old masters, and the son followed by collecting 20th century modernism. Eventually, amassing probably one of the world's biggest private collections. Tyson was a tax exile at this section living in Liechtenstein. The collection was huge, and as he got older, he started shopping around with national governments to give it to him. And the idea was to give the whole collection away. Eventually, he settled on Madrid. This probably had a bit to do with the fact that he also collected wives, his forced wives, from in Spain. You know? But that is in May, um, the Spanish government eventually got the collection, and it's now in Madrid, and um, there's a huge group of the Spanish government. Uh, by complete contrast, uh, Count Giuseppe Panza, uh, modestly wealthy compared to Tyson. Panza, Panza collected, tended to collect living artists, mostly sculptors. A totally different strategy. So he used to invite the living sculptors to come to his villa in the Po Valley and create installations. Installations were a type of temporary sculpture that you made. This is something that's very hard for public galleries to do because they can't give permanent space to an installation. Uh, uh, Panzer had a huge villa, uh, and he was doing this for a couple of decades. Eventually, he ran out of space, you know, and he was getting old. Um, again, after much negotiation, the Panzer collection went to, uh, they went to California to a public collection. I can remember the point at which Panzer was negotiating with different governments to give the collection away. Um, totally contrast, Victor and Sally Gantz from New York. Um, a very ordinary couple, not particularly wealthy. Um, what's significant about them is they had a very small collection, only younger in the hundreds. They only ever connected to the work of about a dozen artists, uh, mainly early Picassos and very late American Martins painters, um, Robert Rauschenberg, Frank Stella, Jasper Johns. Um, Victor, in 1941, bought a castle painting called La Rive um, for $7,000, or the equivalent of about two years' rent on his apartment uh, at the time. As I said, they weren't that well off, but they had this remarkable connection. And you can see their dates. Um, when Sally died, um, his children, to pay off inheritance tax in the state of New York, auctioned 58 pieces from their collection, and for which they got $208 million. Just an ordinary problem, you know? Um, my last example is probably the best known to you, Charles Sachi. Uh, all around tastemaker and farmer Adnan. Uh, the legend goes that Sachi was only interested in comics until his ex his ex wife, who was Irish, Doris, got him into contemporary art. And strat Sachi's strategy is completely different. He specialised as a young living artist, often students. In the 1990s, he was known to buy the entire works, the entire student shows of some artists. He's probably generally responsible for the creation of the world, for the promotion of the YDA with young British artists. A startlingly successful movement in recent years, they all became uh, major names. Um, Sachi wields immense power in the art world, he's an enormous collection. Um, the YDAs and that movement, there's Damien Hurst, Tracy Inn, and people you've heard of. Um, the couple of things happened during this period in London. Um, the Tate Modern opened in the year 2000, and the Freeze Art Fair opened in 2003, another aspect of the commercial art world. And Freeze became very quickly as important as the big giants like the Venice Biennale and the Ball Art Fair. Um, while all of this was going on, another significant thing happened. Only people began to buy art in the UK. It's arguable from the wealthy early, from the 80s, early 90s, that London became um, more important artistically than New York in the scene. Um, and Sachi also has to be given credit for one of the most influential shows in recent times, Sensations, which travelled 
Um, you can get the uh, brochure, of the, you can actually find the original um, program for that in place like Vibes and Scribes. That put all these household names that you've heard of, like uh, Damien Hurst and all these people, on the map, and it's toured around the world. And there's all been researched by the collection. Um, a criticism of Saatchi is that he wields too much power as a tastemaker. Um, he can, Saatchi's name is so big that dealers of galleries will massively discount the book to sell it to him because the prestige of having one of their artists in the Saatchi collection. Also, his collection is so big, from time to time he strips it out. He'd sell off portions of the collection. Um, this is sometimes is thought to have a disastrous effect on the careers of some artists. The implication is that if Saatchi sells your work, your work must somehow be mediocre, you know, yeah. and it's quite possibly ruined a few careers. So, such is the work of connecting. Yeah. All right, this brings us to the art world of today. Okay. <laughs> um, as I see it, I said, it's a very diverse world. Um, there's no real movements. Artists have to make a lot of noise today to be seen to establish a profile. And here are two experts in self promotion. Um, Andy Warhol here. Um, Warhol was very clever at manipulating the media, I suppose. Um, he was eminently quotable. He got a lot of journalists on side. Um, he was also probably one of the first of the modern artists to use industrial processes to produce his work. You know, um, like screen printing on the vast scale. His editions of his printed, printmaking editions used to go one into 5,000, which is unheard of. Um, <coughs> very, very successful. It's not for nothing that his, uh, his studio is called The Factory. Um, over here, this is Jeff Koons. Um, the Light and Well, still very successful. Koons could be thought of as the, kind of like the bastard son of Warhol. Um, Koons is truly outrageous and hugely successful. I wouldn't be a great fan. His, uh, his signature pieces are like oversized children's toys, like enormous teddy bears and blow up um, dogs. Um, but for sheer audacity, it would be hard to beat um, it would be hard to beat his work when he married, he married a former Italian prostitute, it's hard to pronounce, La Sicilina. I think the marriage lasted about six years and produced a son. But he successfully turned their lovemaking into a series of sculptures and semi-paintings. And you, that's slightly blurred, but I think you can get the idea of what he's doing, you know? And it's amazing what people do. All publicity is good publicity. Um, it seems to say. Now, that's the kind of cynical view of these things, but you've got to remember, as art schools turn out thousands of graduates every year, a tiny minority of them will ever get a one-person show, ever so pitchy, much less make a living out of their art. Um, one probably has a better real chance of becoming a successful writer or actor. Um, even the well-known and apparently successful artists of today uh, will be forgotten in just a few decades. Their work on sale, valued only by a few royal collectors. And the artists would work in public collections now. And there's a very good chance that their work will be taken off. Very few of them will survive in the long term. Posterity in the art world is extremely unforgiving. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, you probably noticed the general theme of we talk about Europe and America that the rest of the world doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, I'll address this now. Um, modern art is a bit like rock and roll. It's a sort of a Western phenomenon, uh, starting in Europe uh, and then spreading out. Its influences were Asian and African. Uh, but it's largely a, a worldwide phenomenon now. Um, I'm going to address just two countries here. Um, we've talked about socialist realism. We just saw paintings done in Mao's China. With the advent of the new economy, suddenly Chinese art broke through this modernism. Uh, very, very fine and refreshing work. And it's 
uh, an obsession in the art world to talk about the death of painting. And I've got to hand it to the Chinese, they've bred me like that into painting. Um, one of the best shows I've seen in the last five years I saw in court was the SIG collection of modern Chinese art. SIG was the Swiss ambassador to Beijing about 15 years ago. And he served his wife for a big collectors of private art, uh, or a rug, private collection. And they were in a, they were at a growing time to pick up modern Chinese work by Qi. Since then, these people, all these painters have become world famous and highly collectible. Um, Chinese art became um, very valuable very quickly. Uh, very refreshing. I just, I love their sense of humor, you know. Uh, it's, it's fantastic that after years of dreary, dead social realism that you get this kind of thing. Um, well. Okay. You know, probably the best known of the modern Chinese, and you probably know the name, is Ai, Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei is probably best known for the co-design of the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. Uh, a bit of an anarchist, as you can see. He was also did an amazing uh, installation in the Tate Modern, uh, the sunflower seeds, and mm. uh, something crazy like about 200 million individual ceramic sunflower seeds, all hand painted. I thought they were mass produced. They were actually all hand painted. He employed something like about five tons, you know, thousands and thousands of people painted these things. Sounds weird, but, you know, um, quite a character. I really is probably. Has become victorious or has become a so that the Chinese authorities locked him up for about two months for alleged tax evasion. It's probably put up charge. It's more likely for his outrageous criticism of the regime. He's quite fearless. Um, but anyway, socialist realism. Now, the curious thing happened here. These paintings, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the creation of the new state of Russia. And um, there was thousands of these uh, bombastic canvases. Suddenly, this stuff became saleable in the West. I see galleries in London selling this stuff. And a great many Western buyers started buying these things. Perhaps they loved its excellent 